All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Jake Shermeyer. Um, I'm a research scientist with a lab called Cosmic Works. We're an applied research lab focused on uh, hard geospatial problems and uh, computer vision. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about um, some work in time series analysis. It's a time series visualization tool and software package called Comet Time Series, Comet TS, uh, and specifically some of the, the applications that I, I test with this. So. Uh, we're going to be investigating some temporal trends in the time series of imagery with this open source tool. Um, so what is Comet TS? Ultimately, it's a uh, time series analysis tool and visualization package. Uh, so kind of the old workflows to really do a lot of this work are, are pretty tedious, especially in, in GIS applications like ARC or QGIS. Um, so this was our goal is really to create a new workflow that would allow people to hit the ground running and get results early and quickly and kind of tease out trends in a, a comfortable and easy to use fashion. Uh, so it's coded all in Python. Uh, it also works with Jupyter Notebooks. So all you really need is, is a web browser and Python installed. Um, ultimately, the uh, steps to use Comet are to uh, draw an area of interest on a satellite image. So this can be any area of interest. Uh, what makes Comet unique is that it an analyzes polygons rather than individual pixels. So we're going to drill down uh, through this polygon and extract uh, any relevant statistics inside the polygons. So this could be the, the average brightness, the standard deviation. Uh, you can define the statistics that you're most interested in. Uh, from that, you can extract anything that's, that's relevant in this tabular format. So you can export that for, for further analysis. And it, the, the final step is kind of this this cool visualization step, which I'll, I'll talk about more as, as we get into this to, to really see what's, what's happening with your data. Um, so kind of just a, as an overview, I'm going to be walking through a, a few case studies. Uh, specifically, we're going to be looking at uh, population dynamics, change detection, and, and disaster response. Um, so it's really built to work on a, a lot of diff different problems and, and assist, with, assist with these. Um, I think this room should be fairly comfortable with satellite imagery, I would hope. Um, we've got kind of a lot of different variations on satellite imagery in terms of spatial resolution. Uh, Comet is really designed to work more with the, the lower res data that has a consistent revisit rate that is consistently on the same look angles. Uh, you want to have cloud masks, you want to have snow masks, all, all those things are really uh, incumbent and, and necessary for, for, for Comet to work well. Um, the main case studies I'm going to be showing today are MPP VIRS, nighttime lights data. So this is day and night band, well, not night band specifically here, I suppose. Uh, using, um, so, so the sensor collects on a daily cadence, uh, and I'm going to be showcasing some of the monthly composite data. So uh, every single observation in a month is aggregated together, and that can be used to uh, show trends over time and estimate changes in population, uh, electricity, and e economic production. So just kind of as a case study here, uh, Naomi Niger is in sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, it is a, a location where we see a lot of seasonal migration patterns. Um, so uh, often in the uh, wet season, there's more agricultural work available. So people tend to leave the city. And in the dry season, they, they come back into the city for, for jobs. Um, so why is this important? What, why do we really care? Uh, there's been quite a few measles outbreaks in Niger over uh, the past years. And really estimating where people are is really important for uh, delivering vaccines and aid to uh, areas in need. So uh, if a population is going up and down, you're going to have inconsistent census results. And nighttime lights can really be used as, as a proxy to estimate where people are over time. Um, so just kind of walking through what Comet outputs as a standard output. We've got the uh, brightness on the y-axis here. So that's how, how bright it is at night, given time. And then on the x-axis, we, we have our, our date, stretching from 2012 to uh, the mid middle of 2017. And the black dots on this chart are going to be your, your median brightness in the city. Um, so this could be median whatever your unit is that you're looking at if you're using multispectral data. Comet also can work with that. Uh, really, any data that is can hit, GDAL can read, Comet, Comet can work with. Um, beyond that, we also have uh, kind of this darker gray area, which is the standard deviation of brightness. So how variable is the brightness over time given, given, in your given area? 
plus our, we have two trend lines here, so kind of the linear trend and then a Gaussian signal filter showing a, a smooth, smooth trend. So uh, some of the main work we did with this tool was uh, investigating the effects of Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. Um, so if you're not familiar with Maria, this was a very significant storm uh, about two years ago now. Uh, caused 92 billion U US dollars in damage and the second longest blackout in world history, which is, uh, was a significant event and one that uh, was really in the news quite a bit. Uh, fatalities of the storm were also quite significant. Um, and we used Comet to kind of evaluate uh, independently from what the official estimates were, how much infrastructure had potentially been lost, and more specifically, how much electrical failure uh, resulted fr from the storm. Uh, and certainly, emigration out of Puerto Rico was also a side effect of Maria, with I think over 100,000 people being estimated to have left uh, the U.S. territory for mainland U.S. or, or other locations. Um, so as I kind of stated, the, the, the research objectives already, but uh, just to kind of visualize where the storm came from. So it came from uh, the southeasterly direction and moved uh, to the northwest uh, directly across the island. Um, so really to estimate the number of persons without power over time, we needed uh, a standard unit. Uh, in this case, we used census tracts. So if you're not familiar with the U.S. Census, it divides areas up into... Uh, Regions of interest, in Puerto Rico, there's over 900 census tracts, uh, and each census tract has on average about 4,000 persons in it. Um, so here we can uh, use our historical baseline of time series data, stretching back from 2012 to just before the storm in August of uh, 2017, and pull out what, what the brightness looked like there um, before the storm hit, and then we can actually fit a uh, a model to this. So it's an autoregressive integrative moving average model. And this uh, model has been around since the 60s. It's used for like sales forecasting. Are you expected to have more sales at a certain time of year? Um, and uh, we can use this model to, to fit to our data and then detect uh, anomalous observations. So see how much darker areas are. And you can see how significantly darker this, this uh, census tract was in the uh, southeasterly portion of the island. And also notice here the standard deviation of brightness is really uh, tightened up. So there was a lot of variability. There were, there were buildings that were quite bright and quite dark uh, previously. But as they've turned the power back on, only you can see that only really a select couple number of buildings are, are coming back online slowly. Um, and then we can kind of visualize how these, these things change over time. So this, is going, this next graphic is going to show you the percentage short. Um, of the amount of brightness we expected to see over time and really monitor areas that were the slowest to recover following Maria. So if this GIF plays, it does. So this is before the storm. Obviously, we're, we're seeing healthy brightness levels where they're expected to be. Then as the storm hits here at the end of September, um, we can see that this big drop in brightness level. So the darker the red is, the, the darker it is versus historical trends. Um, and we can see the I island gradually recovering here. I'll just let this run one last time here. So again, the storm hits uh, right about now. Uh, so the whole, there's a whole island-wide blackout. You can see the areas in the southeast and central rural areas really slow to recover. And really, even by May, most of the island is 20 to 30 percent darker than we would expect it to be. And these slides were built in in case the GIF didn't work. Uh, so again, December, February, May. And you can really see the southeast there is still, still quite a bit darker than we, we would expect it to be. Um, so with this information, we can compare against the uh, official estimates from the Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority uh, to really track uh, how closely our remote sensing estimates are uh, you know, related to the the official estimates here. Um, and really, they tracked quite closely uh, because we're using the monthly composite data. You can kind of see this stepped off trend line here. Um, and the, uh, red, the red line here is the official estimates from the, the Electrical Power Authority. So uh, they, they match pretty closely, again, until, until the very end here. These two spikes in the red line at the end were 
uh, single or two two day power outages caused by re really simple events like a bulldozer backed into uh, a power line and that downed electricity for the entire island for, for a day. It just kind of shows how fragile uh, the situation was there. Uh, but ultimately by the end they said less than 1% of the, the persons ha are without power as of May 31st. Our estimates indicated that roughly 13.9% of the persons were without power at that time, uh, plus or minus 5.6%. Always need some error bars on that. Um, so uh, there's uh, basically kind of the conclusions of this are that the, they seem to be of, uh, underestimating the number of persons without power at, at this time. Um, another conclusion is that the grid is 99% repaired. Uh, however, uh, infrastructure has been lost, so there's not as much light emitting infrastructure remaining on the island, and that's really what could be causing this discrepancy. Um, population drops also could be attri attributable to this. Um, so, as I said earlier, over 100,000 persons may have left the island as a result of, of the um, storm, so that this, this certainly could be factoring into to this discrepancy as well between the official and, and our estimates. Um, so, if you'd like to read uh, some more about this, uh, we have a, an archive paper out. Uh, so this appeared in SPIE Remote Sensing uh, last year, um, and this kind of just focuses on all the analysis I, I, I talked about uh, and showcases some of what you can do with Comet. Um, Comet also features uh, multispectral visualizations as well. So if you have multispectral data, you want to work with that. Uh, I think that would be of great interest to this community. So here we're working with Landsat data. We've got surface reflectance on our y-axis and then our, our date again on the x-axis. And you can see uh, kind of the changes over time in the lower ninth ward. Uh, in New Orleans, we've got surface reflectance here uh, for SWEAR2. Uh, the near infrared and visible green bands uh, visualized. So you can see a, a major drop off in 2005 as a result of uh, Hurricane Katrina. Um, and uh, if, if you want to test Comet out, again, as I said, it's, it's in Python. There's a number of tutorials that I, I wrote. Uh, so Jupyter Notebooks, you can just kind of follow along and, and work with it. Uh, if it's pip installable right now. Uh, if you're working on a system that it's difficult to install GDAL on, like Max, you might want to do the uh, Conda environment or, or do, uh, build a Docker file. Uh, but we also have lots of Pi tests. Things sh should be running it as expected. Uh, and just some information channels. Uh, the GitHub repo, as, as I mentioned, uh, we have a blog, so we're, we're pretty active bloggers, uh, have had a lot of blogs uh, recently, not so much fe featuring a comet, but uh, other stuff like SpaceNet, you might want to follow along with that. And we have a, a podcast that uh, we just released one on Comet on Tuesday, so if you want to hear me talk some more about this uh, over and over again, uh, you can keep listening to that, download, subscribe, all that. Um, so yeah, how much time do I have? Okay, well, all right. Um, all right, I'll just run through one more example here, uh, considering we, we have some time left. So this was a refugee camp uh, north of Syria, and uh, this refugee camp was established uh, in southern Turkey to kind of as a result of the, the Syrian civil war. Um, and it's about 35,000 uh, refugees, uh, tents that, that have popped up uh, as a result of the, the, the refugee crisis. And uh, we can kind of see this, this rapid development over time in our, uh, our multispectral imagery here, the high, higher resolution data on the left. Uh, ultimately, what we're reading in with Comet on the right is going to be the, the nighttime lights again, so we can, can see what, what's happening on the ground. Um, so this is uh, kind of an example of just, just change detection and rapid land use change, what we're seeing here. So this 30,000 person increase in population is uh, easily observable in the nighttime lights imagery. Um, so I think you know, tracking, tracking refugee movements, those sorts of things is certainly another applicable task you could do with Comet. Uh, the, the, this uh, big spike in brightness levels here uh, is, is really quite significant. Uh, even at that peak high standard deviation uh, range there, the, the dark gray area, 
uh, that, that brightness level is uh, brighter than most major uh, European cities. So obviously this is a, a more of a centralized tight location. Um, but I just think that's interesting. It's show showcasing that there's probably some nighttime uh, development happening there and more activity than we would uh, expect to see otherwise. Um, so yeah, I think I'll leave it there and uh, happy to answer questions. Yes. Is there a limit on the size of uh, data that you can pump through Comet? Uh, yeah, so that's a good question. So uh, the way I build it is it will uh, drill down, it'll use GDAL to drill down through your area of interest. So it's not reading in each image the, the whole time, it'll just read in each individual chunk of the polygon that you're, you're analyzing. So that, that speeds it up. Um, and I should mention it, it does all the cloud masking. So if an area is you know, greater than 50% cloudy, it'll just throw that observation out. Um, yeah. Uh, you said uh, if, if, if it's 50% cloudy, but um, so is the option to throw it out or not throw it out, or can it do like a per pixel, like masking out these pixels, but then use count the rest of the pixels and use that for the statistics? Is that what it's doing? Yeah, correct. Yeah. Okay. All yeah. right. That's how it works. So um, you can threshold kind of like, okay, is it 50% cloudy? I want to get rid of it. Or you could set that threshold higher or lower based on uh, the amount of observations you really want to use. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, everybody.